everyone, we're going to be giving serial protocols the redstone treatment over a series of short videos. And to get the ball rolling, we're going to start with I squared C. And over the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to lay out exactly what you need to know about this serial bus. So, let's start at the beginning. I squared C stands for Inter-Integrated Circuit. And though it might seem like it's been around since the dawn of time, it was actually released by Philips Semiconductor, which is now NXP, in 1982. There are a few different ways of abbreviating inter-integrated circuit. The most common is probably I squared C, followed by I2C, which is easier to roll off the tongue and doesn't need superscript to write. Finally, there are some people who say IIC, but we don't talk about them. Really though, none of these are wrong. Just use what you're most comfortable with. I use I squared C and I two C interchangeably. One other thing that causes confusion is SM bus or SMB. This is the system management bus, which is essentially an extension of I squared C, spearheaded by Intel in 1995. It is possible to control I squared C devices with an SM bus host, as they are generally compatible. But there are hardware and software gotchas that you need to be wary of when trying to do that. Anyway, the good news for I squared C is that no license has been needed since 2006. And because the protocol is so versatile, it's become a very widely used communications tool. Right then, with that out of the way, let's take a look at the hardware we need to get devices communicating together with I squared C. And you can probably see straight away why this protocol is so popular with chip makers. We only need two pins to implement it. One pin is SDA, that's the serial data line, and the other is SCL, the serial clock line. You'll notice that we have a pull-up resistor on each line, and we'll get into why we need those in a moment. But that's it. That's all the hardware we need to communicate between two devices. And if you want to communicate with more devices, just add them to the bus. This simplicity is what makes I squared C popular with users. So let's flesh out some of the specification details here. The supply voltage can be anywhere from 1.2 volts up to 5.5 volts, but most often you'll see either 3.3 volts or 5 volts being used. The serial clock line is driven by the master, and only the master, to synchronously clock data to and from slave devices. The serial data line is bidirectional and operates as half duplex, because the master is the initiator of all transactions on the bus. This means that any given transaction will only be the master reading data from a slave or writing data to the slave in one direction at a time. You can have more than one master in a system, as every master monitors the bus for start and stop bits and won't begin a message if the SDA line is busy. There's also an arbitration protocol should two devices try to transmit at the same time. That said, most common use cases will have a single master, which you might hear referred to as a controller, and multiple slave or peripheral devices. For example, a microcontroller with several MEM sensors. The other thing that you will have spotted is that each of the slave devices has a unique address on our bus so that we know which device we're dealing with at any one time. The specification has two address spaces defined, 7-bit and a more rarely used 10-bit address scheme. In standard 7-bit addressing, the slave address is clocked out most significant bit first and then on down to the least significant bit, followed by a read-write bit which specifies whether the master is sending data, in which case it will bring the line low, or requesting data by bringing the line high. 10-bit addressing uses two frames to transmit the slave address. The first frame starts with a reserved address that starts with four ones and a zero, followed by the two most significant bits of the 10-bit address. The eighth bit of the first byte is the read-write flag. The full eight bits of the next byte is used for the rest of the 10-bit address. You'll notice that there's an acknowledge bit between each byte. The ninth bit of every frame in a message is where the receiving device should pull the serial data line low. If that doesn't happen, the inference is that the receiver did not receive the byte or couldn't pass it, so the transfer is halted and it's up to the master how to proceed after that. It could repeat start the message, send another byte or send a stop condition to release the bus. This might seem a little finicky for a simple data transfer, but it allows the system to recover from a lot of what could go wrong with a transmission. For instance, a slave device being non-functional 
or even becoming non-functional during a transmission. So when we look at a complete I2C message, it begins with a start condition. This is followed by the 7-bit address of the target device, and then the read-write bit to show which way the data is expected to flow. The master waits for the acknowledge, and assuming it gets one, data frames can then flow in the specified direction, each separated by an ACK bit. Finally, there is a stop condition. In terms of timing, the start condition is indicated by the master when it pulls the data line low before it pulls the clock low. Both these lines will be high when at rest. The 7-bit address is clocked through and the read-write bit will be a 1 if the master is requesting data or a 0 if the master is sending data. The master releases the data line for the slave to pull it low for the acknowledge. The data frames are then clocked through with an ACK between each frame. Finally, the stop condition is indicated by the master letting the data line go high after the clock line. The bus has then been released. And when we look at exactly how data is clocked through, we find that the data signal is updated on the falling edge of a clock signal and then sampled on the rising edge of the next clock pulse. This gives the data some settling time before it's sampled. So what sort of signalling speeds are we looking at? Well, the original spec from 1982 had a transfer rate of 100 kilobits per second, and in 1992 the spec was tightened for a new mode called Fast Mode that allows 400 kilobits per second signalling. And this was actually the first formal standardising of the spec. Standard and Fast Mode are by far the most common rates used, and they are more than adequate for most sensors, though there are lots of devices that also support Fast Mode Plus, which was introduced in 2006, and they use smaller pull-up resistors to allow for faster switching, up to a megabit per second, but this does increase the current on the bus. However, all of these modes are generally compatible. Then there is high speed mode. In this case, both master and slave must be high speed enabled to get the 3.4 megabits per second transfer rate. This speed is achieved by master devices having current source active pull-up circuits on the clock line to shorten the rise time. To initiate a high speed transfer, the master will send a reserved address at standard speed after the start condition. This reserved address begins with four zeros and a one. If the master receives the acknowledge, it will continue the transmission at high speed. High speed devices are backward compatible, so they can be used in mixed device systems. The ultra fast mode is pretty specialized, and I'm not sure how often you're actually going to run into it, but it's there for completeness. Of course, when thinking about your actual data rates, you'll need to remember the overhead that I2C has in using ACK bits and addressing with each message. Right, what's next? Oh yes, I said I would talk about why we need pull-up resistors on the data and clock lines. I2C uses an open drain setup with an input buffer for signalling. What this means practically is that the line can be actively pulled to ground or it can be released and pulled high by the pull-up resistor. As none of the devices on the bus actively force the line high, we're protected from the scenario where one device is driving the line high while another is driving the line low, which would effectively be a power rail to ground short that would damage both devices. So looking more closely at how this works, we'll take either the clock line or the data line because they operate the same way. When the device logic wants to bring the bus line low, it turns on the transistor, which goes from having an extremely high impedance when off to providing a very low impedance path to ground. That creates a quick transition as the FET actively pulls charge from any bus capacitance. The pull-up resistor limits the current flow from the power rail. To bring the bus high, the transistor is turned off reinstating the extremely high impedance, which is effectively an open circuit to ground. The bus line is passively brought back to the supply voltage by the pull-up resistor. The rise time is the classic exponential rise determined by the combination of the pull-up resistor value and the line capacitance. You may be wondering how you determine the size of the pull-up resistor. Well, as I mentioned, the pull-up resistor limits the current through the transistor to ground when the transistor is on. The I2C spec sets a maximum current through the transistor of 3 milliamps. This is known as the sink current, and any higher than 3 milliamps runs the risk of overheating the transistor, which could lead to its early demise. The other thing a high current will do is increase the voltage drop across the FET. 
which although low is not zero impedance. The higher the current, the further away from zero volts the bus line voltage will be when we want a logic low. The maximum low level output voltage allowed by the spec is 0.4 volts. Above that we will not register zeros when we're trying to bring the bus low. Obviously we want to avoid that, so we can do some back of a napkin sums to get our absolute minimum values for 5 volt and 3.3 volt systems. So, using basic Ohm's law, our resistance will be the supply voltage minus our maximum for the low voltage level, which is 0.4 volts, and we divide that by our 3 milliamp maximum current. So doing that for 5 volts gives us a minimum resistor size of 1.53k ohm, and 967 ohms for 3.3 volts. Typically, you would be using 2k to 10k resistors in your design, depending on the bus capacitance. The spec puts a maximum limit of 400 picofarads on bus capacitance. Though with its smaller resistors, FastMo Plus can be up to 550 picofarads. It's this capacitance that ultimately constrains the physical length of an I2C bus, and why they are generally only a few inches long if you're using wires. And of course it's preferable to be using a PCB trace, where you have more control over the capacitance. Talking of PCBs, there are many companies out there making breakout boards for sensors and other devices. Here's an example of an Adafruit breakout board for the Bosch BNO055, which is an absolute orientation sensor that fuses data from an accelerometer, gyroscope and magnetometer to provide 9-axis awareness of device position and orientation in space. It's a nice little module that you can pick up for less than £35. One of the things it does for us, if you look at the schematic, is provide 10k pull-up resistors on the module. So all we have to do is connect the I2C pins on our Arduino, Raspberry Pi or whatever we're using, and we're set, ready to start programming. However, something to perhaps be wary of if you intend to use multiple modules like this one, is that as you add them to the bus, you're putting more pull-up resistors in parallel. And if you remember your circuit theory, resistors in parallel present a smaller total equivalent resistance. That will, of course, tend to increase the voltage drop across the transistor, and that could take us above the 0.4 volts low-level output voltage. How many modules could we use in one go? Well, it will depend on the pull-up resistors on each board. But let's say they're all 10k resistors in a best-case scenario, like our Adafruit board here. In that case, 10 of them will have a 1k equivalent resistance, which is okay for a 3.3 volt supply voltage. But we're looking at only 6 boards if we're going to use a 5 volt supply. Just a little something to bear in mind while you're experimenting. I think that we can finish up by saying that when it comes to programming I2C operations, and we're not going to cover that here, that's a whole other video. But when it does come to programming, there are libraries to support this in pretty much any language you might want to use. And that includes Python, which has an SM bus class that includes a range of I2C functions. That's about it for today's video, so all that's left to say is stay safe and see you soon.